this road. Luke chapter 24. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away. In the Greek it reads, tossed away. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. I've always liked Easter. You know, it's been a great, great holiday so much. Good morning. Where is he? Do you know where he is? I don't know where he is. Where did he go? Where is he? Oh, OK. Just a little tomb humor, OK. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey, you got, got you, huh? When I was a little kid, growing up in the Bronx, uh, and Dad, maybe you remember the guy's name. His name was Jimmy Love. You remember that name? He lived across the street. Sweet old guy. And I'll never forget about a year before he died, it was, uh, there was a lunar eclipse happening. 
And so he was outside sitting on uh, like a beach chair kind of thing. And I remember we just got finished playing stickball. It was a beautiful clear night and uh, the uh, well, at late afternoon actually and the eclipse began. And so I was sitting asking him questions and he was telling me all about what eclipses mean and stuff. And I, I think that's part of the reason I got interested in astronomy. And then this real, uh, I, I said to him, hey, I said, Mr. Love, when, when, is, when is the next eclipse? And uh, this sad, I mean sad, look came upon his face. He said, oh, it won't be for a few years, but this is the last one I'll see. And I said, well, I, what do you mean? He goes, well, he goes, I won't. He goes, I'm an old man, and my time is coming. And with that, you know, I went and played stickball, you know, a real sensitive kid. OK, I see you. <laughs> yeah, you're a kid. Jimmy Love. His last name was Love. You know, we have a family in the church called Hate. So <laughs> if the Love family intermarried with the Hate family, they'd have a love-hate relationship. <laughs> Pretty good. You said you were sick of the old jokes. I'm making up new ones. What can I tell you? Ah, <laughs> oh, shut up. <laughs> shut up. And Jim, you should eat potato chips more in the morning. How about that voice? Whoa, man. <laughs> I don't think there's another church in the world, an evangelical church, at five minutes before the service, one of the music ministers would say, do you think I have time to run to the deli and get potato chips? <laughs> Anytime you need them, James, you go get them, brother. <laughs> Emmaus Road is, uh, we were there, we opened our trip this time, going there, and they're trying to revive this area for pilgrims to come because it really is such a, an important uh, part of the historical account of the resurrection of the Lord. In this uh, Pilgrim to the Holy Land book, it's a, it's, a, it's a guide that includes a lot of good spiritual meat. And concerning this, this account that we read that happened late in the afternoon, which it's already now in Israel, one of the uh, prayers here is, come to us, Lord Jesus. Come to us as we search the scriptures and see God's hidden purpose. Come as we walk the lonely road, needing a companion. Come when life mystifies and perplexes us. Come into our disappointments and our unease. Come at table where we share our food and hopes, and in so coming, open our eyes to recognize you. Father, it is strange how often the dearest things seem unfamiliar. The nearest things seem so far away. On Easter day, Jesus was not recognized when he walked with two of his disciples to Emmaus. He spoke to them and listened to them and proved to them how necessary it was for the Christ to suffer if he was to enter into his glory. He made them see that Calvary was all of a peace with Moses and the prophets. Inspired by his presence, the disciples pleaded with him, stay with us, for night is coming on and the day is almost spent. What that means, and, and the original bears this out, I think, beautifully. Have you ever had guests over your home and you were having such a good time you didn't want them to leave. <laughs> well, that takes care of that illustration. <laughs> but you know what? And the, the, the hours fly by. But have you ever had other company? <laughs> and it's like that Soviet torture clock they used to put in Catholic schools. Big clock in the front of the class with the second hand. That's like that hell illustration about a bird landing on a boulder and pecking it every thousand years, you know, that kind of thing. 
But here, stay with us. For the night's coming on, the day's almost spent. Christ, at the time incognito, agreed and sat down with them at table. He assumed the role of host. He took the bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave them a share of it. Father, give us this food, for this food will sustain us on life's journey and save us. Save us from being frightened by the long and lonely night. The reason I became a Christian had nothing to do with the church. Either church, I don't care, Catholic, Protestant, didn't matter. And by that I mean is, is and, and I love the church, but you become a Christian so-called because you fall in love with Jesus. Now I don't know when or how he reaches us. I know for me it was at a very early age that I really loved him. Now, with the advance of technology today, the, the, the generation of kids today miss out on something special, I think. Because of the easy access now to movies and things, the, 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 the awe of waiting for something to come. Like, I, I remember when King of Kings used to be played on the 430 movie, Channel 7. Remember when you'd wait for those Bible movies to come on for some reason that you were drawn to the Lord and you really dug them in Ben-Hur and all that kind of stuff. And you had to wait. They didn't become so familiar that it was like, well, I've seen it a thousand times. Although, when it comes to the Lord, you can never wear out that Jesus of Nazareth tape, can you? But there is a wisdom in holding back to enjoy more. Just as when we were kids with those movies. And now they sit on our shelves, we can pop them in the old VCR anytime we want. But it's, it's that kind of thing here is why Jesus with, withholds his presence from these disciples. He's leading them to just the right moment. He's, he's baiting them. He's, he's wetting their appetite, so to speak, for the big moment where he reveals himself to them. And so the story of Emmaus, as the account of the early to, uh, in the early morning, teaches us a lot, I think, about how the Lord deals with us today. You will note the part I read, verse 8 ending, then they remembered his words. Now we may say, you know, I don't understand this, because if I was around then hanging around with Jesus and, and he told me that he was going to be delivered into the hands of sinful men, Peter understood it. Peter said, it's not, you're out of your mind. It's exactly what the Greek text says in Matthew. When Jesus first says this to them at Caesarea Philippi, six months before his death, Peter says, this is not, I won't allow this, he said. He said, you're out of your mind. Twice I know of in the Gospels, Jesus nearest and dearest said he was nuts. When his ministry started in Galilee and things started really happening, his mother and family came to take charge of him, it says, because they thought he went doozy bots. That's tongues. <laughs> For my Pentecostal brethren, thank you. Literally, the Greek text says, Peter says, Lord, you're out of your mind. Now, if God goes crazy, we're all finished, right? I mean, wow. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Now, some people picture Satan behind Peter. Going, <laughs> but the word Satan means adversary. God himself is called a Satan to his enemies in the Old Testament in, in the Hebrew. It just means adversary. Peter, and you know, Peter loved Jesus, and, and uh, Jesus really loved Peter. I mean, uh, he had to. But he said, Get behind, you're an adversary now, Peter. I, so Peter understood, yet for somehow they didn't want to accept it. Now, I used to trouble over these things till, till I've been in the people business now over 30 years, and I learned about what this thing denial is. And I don't mean that river in Egypt. I mean people can be caught lying and they, won't e they don't even see it. My sister has theories that they're stupid. I said, nobody can be that stupid. <laughs> nobody. If you get hit with a two by four in the forehead, you can't be that stupid. 
It's called denial. It's, we don't want to see it. Someone asked recently, if, if the devil repented, would Jesus forgive him? For, <laughs> First of all, the devil will never repent. His doom is sealed by his own actions, as will all who reject the grace of God. He doesn't want to see it. I mean, he's so maddened by his own uh, vaunted opinion of himself that he really thinks that by persecuting the Jews or the church or this, he's going to stop God's plan. And so learning, uh, it, it, really, if we don't want to face something, we'll forget it or we will redefine it. And that's what happened to these people. It was too much for them to bear. For us, we look back, we, we see it, and we say, oh, it makes sense. But it was overwhelming to them. And so I get from the Easter account that life is not going to make sense. If it didn't make sense at various times to these disciples, for us at various times, it's not going to make sense either. His own uh, vaunted opinion of himself that he really thinks that by persecuting the Jews or the church or this, he's going to stop God's plan. And so learning, uh, it, it, really, if we don't want to face something, we'll forget it or we will redefine it. And that's what happened to these people. It was too much for them to bear. For us, we look back, we, we see it, and we say, oh, it makes sense. But it was overwhelming to them. And so I get from the Easter account that life is not going to make sense. If it didn't make sense at various times, to these disciples, for us at various times, it's not going to make sense either. See, we know the, good, we know the, the, the story, the ending. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15. So for us as Christians, there are going to be moments that our faith even and I, will, will, be, will be perplexed a bit. And I don't mean, I, I guess I, I'm speaking for myself, I, I don't mean to the point of rejecting Christ, not at all, but I mean just saying, you know, Lord, I just don't get this. But you start to get it as time goes on. Like, for example, I mean, it's gotten worse. Somebody uh, uh, does a dastardly crime, and, and, and I've heard dear Christian friends say, why do people do that? Well, see, I, I, I don't wonder why anymore. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached. Verse 2, by this gospel you're saved if you firmly hold to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you uh, as of first importance. So I imagine we should listen to this. This is the most important thing that we better get, not up here, but in our hearts. According to the scriptures, that uh, Jesus, he died for our sins, according to the Tanakh, the Old Testament, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Getting the, getting the hint? According to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve, um, interesting, Judas bought the farm the night before. There were only 11 left. Well, why is it called the 12? Because that's what they were known as. It's not a contradiction. I mean, they could count. After that, he appeared to, now get this. How many people do you think we have here today? Is anybody here good at numbers? Just give me a guesstimate. But that's fine. OK. Um, I don't know what you said, but listen. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. Most of them, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep, not like during this sermon, they died. <laughs> now, my, my, my little walk through this morning wasn't just meant to be funny. Just, can you imagine if... I don't think we have 500 people, but we have a few hundred. That if right now the Lord would just come walking, to, it's not going to happen, so please reset your pacemakers. <laughs> the Lord just comes walking in and says, hi, gang. He'll have, he'll have a Yankee t-shirt on, <laughs> and that kind of thing. And you know, in the back, it would be, who's George? I know where he's going, stuff like that. And <laughs> Shea Stadium, that's when he dies, that's where he's going. But if all of us really saw the Lord, if you saw him and he came to you where you're sitting right now and said, how you doing? Touch me, 
put your, your fingers here in, in the knit. Wow. I guess anything you've dragged with you today to church that you're worrying about would all, be all gone. You would care, if this week you heard, well, I think you're going to die. So, okay, it's been done. I, because you would have seen the Lord. Yet we're told by Peter himself that it's more blessed to believe without seeing, as the Lord said. I don't get that, but I understand it and I accept it. I guess it's because it, it, it's, it's a deeper work of faith. But at one time, it says, 500 people were together and he appeared. That's how come they were all able to die the way they died. That's what gave them the strength to go on. That's what transformed their lives. Now, let's go back to Luke 24. And I guess that's why I love this account so much. Now, those of us who've been to the Holy Land realize that these things all happened within a very small area. It's almost as if in those days, way off in the distance, you can see the skull, the mountain that resembled the skull. There's a painting of the road to Emmaus, more accurate than the nice one that has those like uh, New England trees in it. I like that one, but the, the, those kind of trees aren't there. But there's another painting, that, and, and way, way in the distance, you see Jesus walking down the road, but way in the distance is the skull with the crosses. It's really cool. And he's walking with the disciples. And so this day, above all, should awaken our faith, encourage our faith. There does come a time when um, we are going to be called to put all our chips on the table. I was thinking about that recently. I was just talking to the Lord. I said, you know, Lord, when it's my time, uh, you know, I, I, I put in for this. This is how I want to die. I said, Lord, I would like to do one last Easter Sunday, a sunrise with the sun, please, and um, a, a fantastic Easter Sunday service, and then th at night, die in my sleep. That's what I've put in for. But it's kind of like when you join the army. They say, where do you want to go, Hawaii? You end up in the North Pole. But we'll see. <laughs> we'll wait and see what the commander in chief has to say about that. People of faith, all the things you hear now as you grow, young people, older people, old guys, old ladies, when your time comes, it'll be too late, I think, to cram. But there's such a thing called dying grace. Jesus gave it on Good Friday, one of his first gifts, even in his own agony. Jesus, a criminal, okay? Jesus, remember me. Remember me when you come to the, your kingdom. The other guy says, Jesus, if you're who you say you are, save yourself and us. Now, he wasn't asking for salvation. He was asking to live. The other guy had enough sense. He said, what's the matter? You know, they're talking to each other because they were crucified very close to one another. You'd be able to walk up. The, it's not like the pictures, the cross is way up there, or the greatest story ever told where Jesus carries a 40-foot cross. But it was right eye level, so people could see these people being executed. So the Romans made the point, you don't mess with us. So they were very close to one another, dying. Jesus didn't answer the other man. Sometimes there's just nothing you can say. There's nothing to say. But the other guy did have something to say. He said, don't you fear God even when you're dying? I mean, man, you're going to die. We're going to die out here. And you're still trying to steal. Jesus was impressed with this guy. He saw, obviously, seeing a true repentance. And he looks at the guy. Ba I mean, battered and, I mean, and says, today, this day, you will be with me in paradise. That's dying grace. The th the, when he said that, the guy didn't say, well, how can I really know that? <laughs> when you're crucified, dying like that, the debates all end. 
He, di he didn't think, well, I wonder what I'm going to have to give up for this. So who's more blessed in the long run? The guy that was crucified or Guido Umbazzo who won the $10 million lottery? Who is you see, the reversals that take place? Einstein was, uh, was, as I was, he was a student of mine. He was impressed with Jesus. This is uh, Joe Einstein, I'm sorry, did I? No, Albert Einstein said about Jesus in the Saturday Evening Post, October 26, 1929. He said, as a child, I received instruction both in the Bible and the Talmud. I am a Jew, but I am enthralled by the luminous figure of the Nazarene. Jesus is too colossal for the pen of phrase mongers, however artful. No man can dispose of Christianity with a bone mold. That's French for I have no idea what it means. I think it, good word, just a good word, thank you. I gotta get some of those potato chips. No one can read the Gospels without feeling the actual presence of Jesus. His personality pulsates in every word. So, I mean, if anybody has said to you recently, you believe in Jesus, man, you're really stupid. <laughs> Say, thanks, Einstein. <laughs> the ultimates are in black and white. Today, it's a wake-up call for believers. It's an invitation to those of you who are not truly believers. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, I mean, you're going to go home today, and you'll see it on the news. You're going to see people in the Philippines, uh, in Flushing Meadows, uh, being crucified. I mean, nailed to crosses to uh, commemorate Good Friday. Remember, they'll, they'll show you the film from Friday. Wow, as if we could bear that load, no way. You'll, you'll hear ministers, priests, bishops of all different denominations. The, I saw one. The reporter said, so what, what does Easter mean to you? And the guy said, he had these red robes on, man. And, you know, not a Catholic because they believe purely in the resurrection. This guy goes, well, the resurrection is the culmination of the hopes and figurative language of the fantasies of oh, a woman. You mean, the report is like, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> it was like a Beavis and Butthead routine, man. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> it says he died. He was crucified. He died. And he, on the third day, he rose from the dead. That's what it means. It's not, well, the early Christians tried to find some hope in explaining the death of Jesus. I mean, they go on and on and say, you know, wow, get a life. Either believe it or don't believe it. You can't redefine it. He is risen. He's alive now. Now, he comes to us just like he does on Emmaus Road, but not like that. Verse 27 of Luke 24, I'll wrap it up. And the, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning him, uh, himself. That's why I love the Bible. I look for Jesus. You know, there's an old book, and some Bibles have this, some old study Bibles. It, it's called Christ in Every Chapter. And this brother who did this years and years ago finds Christ in every chapter of the Bible or, or every book where he's revealed, every chapter. It's amazing. He's in there. It's kind of like when you go out. How many of you are going out to a restaurant today? Okay. You know, they have the little page, you know, find the gorilla in the bushes. <laughs> Keep you busy while they're calling out for your food. Okay. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you're looking and you go, oh, wow, there's the gorilla. There's a painting in my, I still can't see it. Uh, it's called The Resurrection. It's one of those 3D things, whatever it is. And you're supposed to stare at it long enough and see it. Still haven't been able to make it out, but other people can. So I guess I got to get saved, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> That's what the Word of God's supposed to be like. There are people who can read the Bible and know it, but then when you see Jesus and he's revealed and he speaks to you from his Word, you are absolutely set free. Jesus needs to become living in your life. And so 
Um, this is the last Easter of this millennium. Okay, we may not have ne Easter next year because of the YK2 problem. <laughs> it may plunge us back into the Old Testament. So, <laughs> I wrote a song. YK2, I'm in love with you. <laughs> I'm a bookseller. Yeah, okay. This is the last Easter. And I mark off in a little prayer book I have, uh, and, and I start thinking, you know, one day you and I, and who knows, who knows, one day you and I, if the Lord does not return in our lifetime, we will spend our last Easter on the earth. When the presence of God breaks through, and I've, look, I've been with people who've died in the faith. I've been with people who've died kind of in the faith. I've been with people who died who were in the faith, but they were weak. I mean, the first one you see will be Jesus. Now, Billy Graham believes angels are going to carry the, the soul, the departed person, into the presence of the Lord. What a flight that'll be. The first Christian martyr was Stephen. He was stoned to death for, for preaching the truth. And as he was on trial, he said, I see Jesus. I see the Lord standing at the right hand of the Father. So apparently, Jesus, to welcome Stephen into the kingdom of God until the resurrection, got up off the throne and welcome Stephen home. I believe that's the birthright of everyone who loves God. And so Easter says amen to that. I am the resurrection and the life, he said. He, he, he who believes in me will never die. I have come to bring the truth. I have come to bring you life. If you believe, if you embrace it, you trust and cling, you will live. In my word, all men will come to know. It is love which makes the spirit grow. If you believe, then you shall live. Keep in mind the things I have said. Remember me, especially today, in the breaking of the bread. If you believe, you shall live. As my father created with his breath, so I too will call you from your death. And if you believe, you shall live. Let's bow our heads together. Musicians, please come up. Father, we thank you for this day above all days in the world. Even Christmas can't top this. We ask, Lord, that as you dismiss us this morning with your blessing, if there are any here that need to come to you this morning in true repentance, that they will do it and they will be born from above, that they will truly become children of God and celebrate your life. Some of us here, Lord, have known you for quite a while now, others from even longer. And our heart aches for those who just don't have it, don't get it. We can't get it to them. They can't grab it on their own. But if their hearts are open, this Easter morning, you will come into their hearts. Help them, Lord. Help them to truly come to you. And we pray, Lord, for the one who knows better, the one who had walked with you and walked away, that this day, they will return never to ever stray again. In Jesus' name, amen. It says in Hebrews that Satan held over, before Jesus came, that Satan held over people the fear of death. And in Jesus, it's removed. I mean, if you know him, I mean, man, you know. Someone once said to an old preacher once, I'm sorry that you lost your wife. He goes, I didn't lose her. I know exactly where she is. Do you know the Lord this morning? Let's bow our heads together. And again, we invite you to come, play something a little soft here, and you make your way to the altars to pray this morning if you need to do that. 
If the Lord is calling you, you know it. You know it in your heart. Should I, shouldn't I, should I, you want to. It's supposed to be difficult. It should be a serious decision that you mow over in your mind and say, hey, you know, and take it seriously. Am I, am I in this thing for the, for the real reason, for the long haul? Or do I want to go my own way? Just like the two guys crucified on the sides of Jesus. One was saved so none need despair. But the other was lost so that none presume. If you don't know him this morning, you come and you give him your heart. He'll take you because he loves you, man. He loves you. So you bow your heads, let's pray. And if you need to come, just make your way out. Anyone for prayer, you come. said wherever two or three gather in your name that you are in the midst and you make yourself real to everyone here Lord we can't do it you said to John I will manifest myself to them and you make it so that we can't miss it Lord thank you thank you for these who've come if just for reassurance that this is real this whole thing is real you are alive. And so go with us today, Jesus. Bless us. Bless our time of fellowship with our friends or neighbors. And be glorified, not only on this day, but every day until you call us home. Rejoice, it's Easter morning. The sun is shining. Christ has risen, he's put to flight the night, and you don't have to fear the reaper, no you don't, 
Well, have a wonderful day, and uh, we'll be praying for you all. I know you have loved ones you're praying for today. How many of you going over to relatives that need the Lord? Okay, stoke the uh, chocolate bunnies with some scripture verses, <laughs> and let them have it. Let your light shine. Just, you don't have to preach. Just let your light shine. Just let them know how much you love Jesus, and he loves them, and it's the most important thing. We'll pray for you.